With beautiful surroundings, comfortable gathering spaces, and picturesque views, the campus of Atria Woodbriar offers the standard of senior living long preferred by the most discerning older adults on Cape Cod. Atria and the selectmen to order. Mary Pat has asked me to chair the meeting tonight because a lot of it has to do with planning. And she claims that I know more about it than she does. I'm not sure, but we'll see. Um, the first on the agenda is the Senior Center update. And you're on, Jim. Good evening. I'm Jim Vieira. I'm the chairman of the Council on Aging and also chairman of the Senior Site and Feasibility Working Group. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here tonight on this wonderful summer evening. Um, the working group members that are here are Bob Leary, Joe Clancy, Wendy Vogel, Sally Giffen, Dick Bowen, uh, Joe Bishop, myself, and Heather Harper. And um, not here tonight. Um, Just Brenda pretty. Swain is away, and as is Ray Young. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, first of all, is just speak briefly, I'll find the clicker, about um, the Council on Aging and what our mission is. And it'll just be uh, just a few minutes. The Senior Center should be a focal point in our community for all our older adults. And our, obviously, our building is not serving that need right now. I'm not really going to go into uh, the need for a new senior center. We've, we've been through that. We've documented that. I think there's widespread community support for a new senior center, and I think there's widespread support for a new senior center now. Um, the slide on the lower right-hand side pretty much sums up in a graphic what we're all about. Um, and what we're going to talk about tonight a little bit to get started is how that how our mission ties in with the facility. And uh, the facility on the left-hand side is the Mashpee Senior Center, which is, was built in 2004 and which serves their mission very well. This is just a quick outline, of generally, of what a senior center should provide. And not just provide in Falmouth, but really provide throughout the state and what we're seeing really throughout the country. Um, for the specifics of what goes on at the Senior Center every day and the specifics of the program, it's outlined very well in the handout that we gave you, Soundings, which is our newsletter that comes out every month. It's also available online through the town website and the Council on Aging page. And it really gives a great, um, a great look at what goes on at the Senior Center on a daily basis and the myriad of programs and services that happen. It's actually quite impressive. When I first came on board the Council on Aging a couple years ago, I was amazed at what goes on there. And really what it comes down to, this is the core. This is what it comes down to. Really the quality of life and providing uh, for independence for our seniors, stimulating uh, both intellectually, physically, and providing uh, an opportunity for them to be socially active. Senior centers are about infrastructure. Uh, throughout the next few minutes, you'll see a few different slides of some senior centers that have been built uh, across the state. You'll see some common themes as we go out, and I'll, I'll point some of those out to you. One of the things that we're seeing a lot of in 21st century senior centers are uh, classrooms for lifelong learning. It's a wonderful way to stimulate um, intellectually, keep the mind young. Uh, there are lots of opportunities for people to come in and give lectures on, on all types of topics. And we find that the seniors in our community um, are very educated. Uh, they are very interested in cultural and educational programs. We did, as you know, we did a needs assessment um, recently. One of the things that uh, was mentioned over and over and over again in the comments throughout, uh, right across the age brackets, were health and wellness programs, the need for health and wellness programs. And this has become a, a very common theme in all senior centers, is, is a provision for those spaces. This particular cafe is, is actually at Atria. Um, 
cafes, again, we're seeing them not just in senior centers, and, and, but in, in a lot of different facilities. And it provides, uh, specifically in a senior center, it can buy, provide an area either before a program or an after a program or after a yoga class or whatever it happens to be for friends to sit and socialize, have a cup of coffee, maybe a, a snack. And, and it doesn't need to be staffed by the town. It can be staffed by volunteers. There are some models where they are actually leased out uh, to a private enterprise. They don't need to be open all the time, just during the core, the core, the the core part of the day when a lot of those activities are going on. There are two types of kitchen spaces that we see in this slide. The lower right hand one is obviously a commercial kitchen, uh, provide uh, for a caterer to do a large, large function, uh, banquets, uh, you know, a seating about up to 200 possibly. And the kitchen on the left is a small facility that's a very comfortable for teaching a culinary class, um, having a guest chef come in and, and teach, a, teach some people how to make a cannoli or whatever it is. Um, also a place where someone can come in and uh, make a birthday cake or cookies for a small party. What we're hoping for is to find a designer and an architect that can combine these two thoughts and make a kitchen that would both be suitable for a large event and also one that would, a home cook would be comfortable enough to come in and, and do something small. Um, as I went through the process and as we've gone through the process of researching other senior centers, I did a quick Google of architects in Massachusetts senior centers and came out with quite a listing of people that are experienced in this. And some of these firms have done 10, 12, 15, 20 senior centers. So uh, we're not inventing the wheel when it comes to designing and building a senior center. This is going on right across the state and across the country. And fortunately, right here in Massachusetts, we have several firms that have a lot of experience. The uh, outdoor recreation for an older adult, very important. The slide on the left is actually uh, behind the Wellfleet Senior Center where I was at a few weeks ago. It's a wonderful garden, very lovingly cared for in a very tranquil setting. Um, obviously, the young lady on the right there is throwing some horseshoes. One of the things we need to think about uh, recreation um, when we're talking about a senior citizen is much different than from a young adult. We're not talking about basketball courts and baseballs, athletic facilities like that. We're talking about gardens, or we're talking about horseshoes, we are talking about sewing machines, we are talking about cooking facilities. Um, so what we would like to be able to do, and we're, we're, we've begun this already, is talking to the community preservation people, and redefining what recreation is. What is recreation for the older adult, and how does that fit in to the Community Preservation Act, specifically under their recreation heading? And so, as we go through this, it's an educational process for the taxpayers and town meeting members and the community preservation people so that we can tap into those funds for the senior recreation component. One of the most important services that our senior center provides are individual services. And they are, can be one-on-one -on -one with the individual or with the individual and a caregiver or a family member. A lot of this is done by volunteers. We have lawyers that come in and give their time. We have tax people to help at tax time. We have medical advice. All that has to be done, obviously, in a private space. So we need small private offices to make that happen. The volunteer coordinator is probably one of the most important people on any staff of a senior center because so much of it is done by volunteers. These are some of the programs that, that go on by volunteers at, at our senior center. Just, uh, and it goes on and on and on. And you can take a look at soundings again to see that. And we have seniors helping seniors, but it's not just seniors. It's just community members. Um, a lot of our seniors are people that are recently retired. They want to stay involved. They want to help. It's a wonderful opportunity for people within the center to help, to help the staffing. 
we really have 35 years of seniors. Uh, I'm on the early end. I just turned 60, a new member of the Senior Center. We have members that come in that are in their 90s. So it's really a wide span of people that we're serving. And, and those programs need, need to be able to go right across the board. Just a couple of, of other pictures. One of the things I, I want to point out, it's a common theme, is this focal entry point. When you drive into a senior center, a 21st century senior center, you know where the entry is. You don't have to guess how you get in. You also see how they have these wonderful covered spaces. So you can drive right up, you can drop somebody off, and within just a few covered steps, they're inside. That's critical. And it's at ground level. No steps, no ramps. You're right in. Uh, this is Marshfield. On the, um, on the right hand side you again see the, the wonderful entry reception area with a little social nook where people can sit and, and, meet, and meet people coming in. Uh, again, this is Mastery. And um, I just want to do a quick hit on the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Program leads. You know, this is going to give us a really wonderful opportunity to provide a facility that achieves that certification. And this should absolutely be our goal to be able to do that. And there's no, really no reason why we can't accomplish that. So I'm going to switch in now to the, uh, the review process, which is kind of what we're what we're here to do tonight, and uh, thanks for bearing with, with me while I went through that. I never miss an opportunity to educate people about what we do at the Senior Center because it continues to amaze me. Um, our working group was formed at a Board of Selectmen meeting in uh, February, and in, in your packets you have, should have our charge statement, and that's also online. And uh, our group began meeting immediately. We uh, had our first meeting on February 18th. And um, our, prior, our first priority was to develop a list of criteria that we'd base this review process on. And uh, I think you have that. That would probably be the third thing in your packet. And we, we also started to compile our list of sites and buildings. And in compiling that site, we were really interested in adding into that list every single idea that came across the board. It may have been something that someone mentioned to one of us at the grocery store or something that a department had, had mentioned. It might have been one of the sites that was reviewed in the previous feasibility study 10 to 12 years ago. But we didn't, we didn't eliminate any without at least some discussion. Um, Jill and I attended a meeting of some key department heads early in the process because we wanted to get their input to make sure that we had the proper criteria uh, to evaluate these sites and that if they had any other input about additional sites that they wanted us to look at. Um, so our, our initial review process started with looking at GIS maps and aerial photographs of the different sites. Uh, Ray Young, who is a member of our committee, was particularly instrumental in helping us do that, as, as was Bob Shea, um, and, uh, and that's how we started. A lot of the working group members went out and visited the sites individually, uh, particularly because there were some sites that, uh, that many of us weren't really familiar with. Um, as the list became more focused, Brenda Swain and I went and had a visit with uh, representatives of the school department, and specifically it was the school superintendent and some of her key staff and the chairman of the school committee at that time. And the reason that we did that early on was because of all of our meetings were open public meetings and we were discussing school properties. That had been part of our charge to consider all the town buildings and all the land. And um, so we wanted them to hear from us uh, without seeing it someplace else that you know, we were talking about their facilities and talking about their buildings. Um, and that was just an information sharing session. Um, one of the things that we use in our criteria, I've got up here, which is the list, uh, which is really the town map, and it shows where the senior populations are in the different sections of the town. And, you know, for, 
it really is, it really shows that the center of the town is really the center of the senior population. It's really spread out. It's really not focused um, in East Falmouth or West Falmouth or North Falmouth. It's just seniors spread out all over the town. So when we, we began our review, we were putting particular emphasis on those locations that were in this kind of this uh, bullseye in the center. Um, so we went through all that and um, we got our list down to eight. Uh, and those are the eight that I, I want to talk about specifically uh, over the next few minutes. This says over 30, it ended, actually be, it ended up being over 40 locations. And I'll just, these two are just an example. The building on the left is the PAL building. The building on the right is the uh, former Baptist church on 28 in East Falmouth. These, I, I show these because these were buildings that uh, many people in the community brought up to us for evaluation. And so it's just an example of some of the places that we looked at. Um, so out of the eight, four of the eight, built, four of the, uh, eight final sites were buildings. So as a group, we went and uh, visited the buildings, and as a group, but we were very careful. We did not discuss uh, any of the sites or communicate uh, with each other about the sites while we were <coughs> on our tour. We saved that until we came back and met the following week in a public session. Um, and uh, these were some of the comments that came out at the Morris Pond School, which was one of the eight sites. Um, this gentleman down here on the rollerblades, the building is huge. When we finished, we all felt that if that was going to be a senior center, we were going to be issuing rollerblades to all our seniors. Um, this, this site is not one of our recommended sites for the reasons that are, are listed up above. Um, and also in a further meeting that I'll talk about in a minute with the school department, the second meeting that we had, um, this is not a building that, that they would be amenable to uh, parting with at any time in the near future. Um, the second site of the eight that we considered is the Augusta parcel. It fronts both on Route 28 in East Falmouth and in the rear um, up here. That's Brookhill Road. We were particularly interested in this upper northern area. The, uh, we anticipate that the need for senior center would be in the vicinity of about five or six acres. Uh, this site was, is 20 plus acres. Um, we like the site, uh, but I've gotten some input from the wastewater committee and they uh, would not be supportive of the senior center on this site. They feel that this site was purchased for wastewater uses, and they want it reserved uh, for that. And I can certainly understand that and support that. This was also bought with um, with money from the Air Force for environmental remediation. So uh, that is also a little bit of an issue. So this is not a recommended site. We went to the T-Ticket School. Um, and this is a site that we were, uh, we had some some real excitement with. It has some pros and some cons. It's, it's obviously much bigger than what we need. The mechanical system, a lot of the mechanical systems in this school are original. And that is from 1965 or 67 or something like that. So, you know, probably regardless of what happens to this building, if it becomes municipal use or school, there's going to be some significant investment that's going to be needed. Uh, we had some questions about how flexible this, this structure would be for what we need to renovate to make a 21st century senior center. Um, some of the things we liked about it <coughs> is the flow of the building uh, around the central courtyard. We particularly like that it's adjacent to the new T-Ticket Park and the open space that's around the building for outdoor activities. And the traffic light at Route 28. You know, a traffic light seems to be a small thing. But it's really critical for seniors to have a comfortable, safe way to get in and out of a facility. And so one of the advantages is that traffic light at the end of Mount and Route 28 uh, makes it a little bit easy for, for people to, to make uh, a safe entry and exit. Ultimately, this is not one of our recommended sites. 
again, the school department in our most recent discussions with them, they are really um, not at a point where they are discussing the, the, um, the ultimate disposition of these buildings and what's going to happen with the education. Uh, I think that the senior process, we are, we're way ahead of the school department and, and their thinking. Um, so this is, uh, although we were very excited about this, um, this is not one of our recommended sites. Gus Canty, this is, this is an interesting site. Our committee, uh, and we discussed this at our last two meetings, uh, unanimously decided that this is not something that we wanted to pursue. Uh, at a meeting that, uh, that Jill and I had with some department heads, um, at some point down the line, when we had the, uh, when we had the, uh, backtrack just for a minute, when we went down to the eight, we re-met with a group of department heads that included the building commissioner, uh, the town planner, uh, the town council, and the town engineer to, to kind of have an overview of these eight sites that we're showing tonight. And those four individuals were unanimous that they did not think that this site was suitable for another use and, and did not think it was suitable for a senior center. Uh, we are not recommending this site for the reasons that are listed here. And these were also the reasons that our department heads mentioned in our, in our discussion. Um, so where does that leave us? The Gifford Street parking lot had been in discussions for a long period of time. Uh, this is steamship parking. Uh, for all of you know, this is just before the self-storage area on Gifford Street. Um, again, that the location is right in the in the sweet spot that we talked about, in the middle of town. Um, unfortunately, the steamship authority is not at an area at a time yet where they know exactly what's going to happen to this site. Uh, they may use it at some point, they may dispose of it, they may put it up for sale, um, but then again, they're not, at, we are ahead of their process and uh, it's not available for us and it probably won't be available in the immediate future. So now we're going to get to the, the three sites that we're putting forward for uh, a recommendation for us to be further considered by a consultant. Um, the first is the school administration building. Um, fronts on Route 28 and Sandwich Road. Just an overhead um, that shows the site. We'd like to have the site evaluated both as a site for a freestanding new building and also what could be done as a redevelopment project on the existing uh, administration building. Uh, a few things that will need to come into play as we evaluate the site is obviously the village input and I think this is probably true of all the sites. The community input from the people that live around the site would be very important. We don't see how uh, we could use this site without the abandonment of the ball field which is a whole nother conversation that we'll have to have with the community. Um, we like the fact that it has access from Sandwich Road as well as from Route 28. 233 Brick Hill Note is our second site that we'd like to recommend. This is the site uh, that we know of as where the dog park is. It's uh, nine and a half acres and uh, the plot plan is on the right and I just gave it all away. <laughs> Let's see if I can get back. May, may not be able to get that. Nobody know how to operate this thing. <laughs> You're on your own, Jim. I am on my own. <laughs> well, I'll just. No promises, Jim. Okay. I'll talk about the dog. The, uh, I'll talk about the site at any rate. Um, it's nine and a half acres. A small portion of that is used as the dog park. Um, again, the location is right where we want it to be. The um, 
one more. One more back. One more blind. <laughs> You're not done yet. <laughs> it's a flat parcel, which always helps for development. Um, one of go. the drawbacks, thank you, Brian, no is problem. that um, it doesn't really have frontage on 28, so visually it could be hidden. However, um, this is the PAL building, and then there's a, also a small home in this area right here that um, in the future it's possible that the town could pursue the purchase of either of those parcels which would open up the view to a, to a building. There certainly is ample space in the center of that parcel uh, for, for what we need to do. As I mentioned, we're looking at you know something like about five acres. So um, we would very much like to have a consultant dive into this site uh, as a, a possibility for a new building. And our final, our final recommended site is at Falmouth High School. Uh, the location is perfect. We particularly like the campus environment. Uh, Jill is very interested in the intergenerational opportunities that we would have with the high school students. High school students interact very well with senior citizens, far better than, than younger kids. Uh, an opportunity to share their facility as far as their uh, recreational facilities outside. Uh, as well as the possibility for the use of their, the auditorium at the high school. There just are a lot of good reasons why the senior center could be located here. Um, on the other side of the coin is the topography of the site. Obviously the flat spaces have been taken already. Um, particularly uh, where we are looking is this northern portion, uh, this that I have this, the point, these are the tennis courts. If you go up uh, Kiffin Street Extension, the tennis courts are on the left hand side. And this is a field that was built by volunteers for, I believe it's girls field hockey and some other activities that go on there. Um, we believe that it would be very advantageous for the town uh, if we could relocate that field and site the senior center there. Um, if that's not doable, we would like to have our consultant really review the whole site um, and to see what other locations are possible. This area here are a series of small kettle holes uh, that would need to be filled if the site was going to go there. Here we have a pocket wetland, so it's obviously not going to be anywhere near there. Um, so that's the high school. So these are our... Uh, what our working group over the last four months has been working on, and this is what we would like to recommend to the Board of Selectmen to consider to uh, put out to a consultant. Um, so what are our next steps? What we're doing tonight is giving a recommendation, and we would hope that the Board of Selectmen would, would determine our final site recommendations. We're in the process of drawing up our request, a draft request for proposals that you should have uh, very shortly. And we obviously need to continue the public input process, particularly focused on whatever it is the sites that we put forward. And again, I'm going to go back to that slide that we had, what is ultimately about the quality of life uh, for our seniors. And that's it. Um, so I would, uh, I really thank you for letting me have 20 minutes. Um, but it's, uh, this is a very important project in the town. And um, I think that uh, we certainly, from the work we put in, we wanted to be able to, to give you the full, uh, the full show of what we've been doing. Um, so happy to answer any questions or and the members of my committee uh, also happy happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much, Jim, for the report. Thank you. And at this point, I'd really like to ask for any comments that people might have, both from the Planning Board and the Board of Selectmen. Are there any comments? Well, gee, you're very <laughs> talkative tonight, Sue. <laughs> I'll throw you a pet if I could just ask Jim. Did you? Thank you. 
When you met with the folks from the school department, did you have any uh, input from them with respect to the intergenerational uh, concept? Um, thank you. Um, we did. And that was at our, our last meeting that we had, uh, that Chairman Flynn was there, and Mr. Suso, and, and Heather Harper, and Jill and I. And we mentioned that specifically, that the re one of the reasons that we liked this high school site was for that purpose. And I think that there was some genuine interest uh, from them to be able to pursue that idea. Thank you. I think the thing I would look at it is there isn't anything wrong there. And the idea to come down with each interest that you have, every single slide would have worked. I think it's the money. And I think it's the difference in whether you have a piece of land and you're starting to build from scratch, whether you're renovating. I, I think on the administration building, um, I don't know the thoughts as far as the historical part of that building. And then I don't know if you're considering two floors or you're just going to take that down. But I'm thinking the money, because there wasn't really one that was wrong. I mean, I think in our minds, each thing that we think about the senior center, you present it. So then I go to the next step. And you had accessibility. Excuse me, Rebecca. We need to get you a microphone. You mean I didn't talk loud enough? <laughs> <laughs> well, the folks on uh, FCTV would have heard you. Oh, okay, so I, I'll just start it again if this is, Sorry. okay, that's fine. I think the thing that we need to consider is the finances of it, because I think each thing that was presented is acceptable. And I, whatever your idea is, whether it's an older building, of course, I look at T-Ticket, and I know maybe that wasn't on one of your favorite, but I look at T-Ticket as it makes the easiest transition. It's all on one floor. But that's another money issue, as, as I understand that. So I would say that the job that we're going to do this evening is rather difficult, not knowing if there's one that, that you could have, and, but you don't know the price, and possibly there's another one that you like just as much. So I, I need a little of the finance part of it. Heather. I'm not sure I give you too much of the finance part of it, but I, I can comment briefly on that, but I wanted to comment on process. Um, just in, in terms of finance, I think you're aware that the Senior Center um, had an earmark value. I can't recall whether that was about $6 million that was set aside um, and planned within the town's multi-year capital plan. So that, that work could proceed if sequenced um, with, in collaboration with the other projects the town has just approved, the very large water and wastewater, that this project could move forward within the same strategy of within a level um, tax effort for the town. So that really depends on the, the sequencing of debt and the decision-making process, that that is something, if the project falls within that range, um, we could accomplish and fund within the existing tax effort. And that's a, that's a, a decision for the community to make in the future. In terms of process, I think tonight was a report from the working group. And the, neither board needs to feel that you need to make a recommendation this evening. I'm sure the, the working group would love to hear that and as what the Council on Aging. Um, but what's most important, and if you recall, the purpose of the working group was to establish a forum for community input. You had a really phenomenal, I can't underscore how um, dedicated and, and talented the working group that you had um, involved was and is. Um, but this really is a public process, and, and I think Jim mentioned, and we can underscore, that the importance of having community input and buy-in and engagement, that there has been a very thorough, rigorous review process of all of the sites. Um, the planning board had a representative on, on that. Mr. Leary, you may want to get back together with him and talk about that uh, and make give some feedback from a high-level planning perspective back to the Board of Selectmen. And the Board of Selectmen really can recommend the sites that would move forward for the next level of review and I just want to comment on the next level of re review will begin initially with a community forum 
um, with a little bit more um, detail than we have here on each of the potential sites that are included. There will be a community feedback me mechanism and a forum for the community to weigh in on the site. So it isn't just elected bodies at the local government level, that there's a little bit more outreach to the community at large, so that when you get to those ballot questions, there's a lot more um, enthusiasm, interest, and support in whatever site is ultimately selected. So I don't think you need to make any decisions tonight, not to lay us off any schedule, but it's really important that there is a degree of community awareness and involvement moving forward. Doug. Just on the two sites of the administration building and the dog park, is there a possibility that on both those sites the present use could remain and this would be an addition or is it only consideration that this would be a replacement to those facilities? Uh, the quick answer is that <laughs> Um, the use could continue, uh, certainly at, at the dog park. The, there's ample land there for their use to stay and to have a senior center co-located on. At the administration building, it obviously depends on, on how that's used. If, if the, the building itself becomes a senior center, then the, the, the activities of the school administration building would have to be located. If there was a separate building built on that facility, then obviously that, their use could continue. If there was an addition to it. If there was an addition or, or a freestanding structure, right. Um, and I just want to just comment on, on the, the money and, and what these things cost. Really, that's why we are hiring a consultant and doing our feasibility study to be able to get that kind of information from uh, the professionals that design and build these things uh, routinely. <coughs> Jim, uh, how much uh, weight did you give the availability of public transportation lines to these sites? Uh, they're not all equal on that, are they? No, and the um, sight lines was one of the 21 criteria that we had on our list, and we considered that actually as we, uh, we evaluated each site and we scored them under each of the 21 criteria, sight lines uh, was actually one of them. And if you remember seeing on the slide of the steamship parking lot, it's on a very gentle curve. And that was one of the concerns we had with that site is that it, it, it is a difficult uh, spot because of that curve. I, I meant existing public transportation bus routes for other people to get there. Right. Um, uh, Brenda Swain, as you know, is part of our working group and the director of the service center. And she's very interested in, in getting uh, some public transportation to be coming down Gifford Street and go by her site. So if, we, if, we can, if we do get a site that's in that core location that we talked about uh, between the, um, the service center and a senior center, I think we'd have a very strong argument for being able to promote some public transportation in that area. Joe? On transportation as well, um, I've spoken with Paula George and working on transportation. We've added, uh, we talked about adding some more routes, some set routes, and they've also added some more of the dial-a-ride uh, programs that we're starting to promote in town because transportation is an issue. So we are working with um, Paula George and Tom Cahir on that. In, in thinking about this, I, I'm not ruling out obviously new development, but I think as we move forward as a community, we have to keep in mind that much of what we're going to be doing in the future is redevelopment. And when uh, buildings do become available, that we should look very carefully at them and try to make the best reuse of them as we can. I'm not saying that that's where the senior center should be, but since there are two existing buildings already in the plan, that I think we have to keep that pretty much in the forefront that re, re, uh, redevelopment is something that we uh, should keep on our priority list. I agree with you, Pat. That's very high um, on the list. The thing that I like about the administration building is the accessibility um, of the roads there. The detriment in my mind is I believe a traffic light would have to be installed because that is a very difficult corner in particular when the traffic picks up. <coughs> excuse me, during the summer months. And something that you may or may not be aware of is that with the local comprehensive plan when we were 
uh, talking with one of the medical people, he would like to see a senior center that would be much like you were describing here. Um, that I think maybe can only be accomplished at the high school, and there is a stopping light, a stoplight there. But I would ask, and I don't know whether you have had thoughts about this or not at this point. Would there be, a, say, a wing of the high school cut out, or how would that happen? It's a different, different part of the lot. But if we're looking at the high school building, because there is excess space there now. I know you said the other part of the lot. But if we're looking at the high school building, which could potentially be a possibility, because you have facilities in there that you could use, have you, did you consider the high school itself as well as the property? When it comes to the high school site, we were only looking at it as a site for a okay. new building, not as a redevelopment site. Um, and But to follow up on that, we did want to make clear to our consultant that they look at the site as a whole, not just as one specific spot. So certainly if uh, there was a strong sentiment that the building also be considered or part of the building or whatever it happens to be, then certainly that could be within the scope of, of the feasibility study. I, I picked up on that because you had mentioned the use of the auditorium. Right. And there are all kinds of facilities there that could be used in the evening. Um, athletic facilities that maybe can be sandwiched in. And so, to me, if you're trying to save a little bit of money and we have excess room there, if you were looking at the high school, it might be wise to look at not only building new, because you wouldn't want to use the auditorium necessarily. That'd be transportation between the two. So those are my thoughts. Anybody else want to make comments tonight? Paul? My, com my compliments to the committee. I think you've done a very interesting project with a lot of criteria there and it was well presented. And you've come up with three sites. And I look at what you're saying is you're talking about a new building on each of those three sites, dog park, administration building, and maybe the high school. So I, I, there's no retrofit on those particular sites. I think the advantage of the school administration building, as was said previously, is the access to transportation. The buses go right by there. It's a very good site for that reason. But also, as mentioned by, uh, by Amy, the interaction with the high school provides some opportunities for other things. As many of the senior areas I've seen elsewhere, there's a junior college or university or something with not only courses, but a lot of activities that are beneficial for both parties. So there's a lot of advantage being in the high school, but there's also advantage on uh, accessibility at the administration building. Thank you. Okay. okay, at this point, because we've got an hour and a half meeting and we've got 45 minutes left, I think I would really want to say thank you and thank everybody who uh, participated in the discussion tonight and move on to the next thing on our agenda, which is the planning scope of work for Davis Straits. And I think you all have copies of that. And we had discussed the continuation of the effort of the Cape Cod Commission in going forward with more effort. And Brian, you're going to be speaking to this.
joint meeting of the selectmen and plan board back in January was asked that we discuss advancing some of the recommendations of the Spring Barns Road study uh, into a new uh, program. And for the sake of time, I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis of this work. Uh, it really calls for the development of two plans. It's looking at a redevelopment plan for Davis Drapes from Heights Road up to the Stop and Shop Lights. It's also looking at a greenway plan. And the greenway plan would be go from Spring Bars Road, uh, <coughs> long area, up to the T Ticket Park and perhaps the T Ticket School. And in your scope of work, to do those two plans, you're looking at three major tasks. So here are tasks two, three, and four in your, in your handout. And very simply, what they propose to do, they propose to do A, a land use plan. And what they'll do is they'll look at development patterns in the area of, of Davis Straits. And they're going to try to find what, what makes it different, what differentiates Davis Straits in that area from, say, another part of the community that has these types of commercial developments and that type of zone. They'll look at the assets that might be there today compare them to the, perhaps some of the strengths and weaknesses of the area. And then they'll come up with an implementation strategy, how to do this redevelopment. They'll talk about some of the tools that we may have today, what we may want to develop in the future. They may be regulatory, such as zoning. They may be non-regulatory, such as financial incentives. The second major task is a transportation plan. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But they'll look at some, some of the issues with regards to some of the roadway uh, issues in the area, some of the limitations, uh, especially the intersections at uh, Heights Road and the intersection at uh, Dillingham and Spring Bars Road. Uh, there are some, some issues there that need to be certainly addressed. They'll also take a look at some of the connectivity uh, Issues, we always ask, how do we get folks from this area of town to some of the community assets that we have, the beaches, the harbor. We just don't want a, a, a plan for a road system. We could hire an engineer to do that, and they do a very fine job. <clears throat> the third major task is the environmental analysis. We did get some very late comments in from commission staff just today. We didn't incorporate here only because you know, we're not going to Make changes here at the very last moment, but we will be dis advancing those discussions with the commission staff a bit. And the environmental analysis is really like the greenway portion. And one of the very most important components of that is looking at that greenway, not from an aesthetic point of view, even though that's very important, it's part of the planning. Uh, we want to look at it from a flood hazard mitigation standpoint. We also want to look at it from a stormwater management standpoint and a recreational standpoint. And it's because if we incorporate those um, issues. Uh, you offer yourself an advantage in terms of grantor agencies such as uh, NOAA or the Department of Interior, the so-called Sandy Grants. Uh, you can, you can uh, open up a, a door of opportunities if you look at those, uh, those very important things. We also want to be able to build that environmental analysis and that greenway analysis into the land use plan and into the transportation plan that, that um, is part of the components here. Now, there are some published reports that regard uh, some funds that may be available to the town to do what's known as a complete streets, uh, to say with the bond bill. Uh, well, those discussions are still being advanced at the staff level and with our friends at the highway department. Uh, so we'll have a little bit more on that later. It might be that the scope of work is amended such that some of the transportation elements that are presented here in this scope of work would be uh, deleted in favor of a, of a vendor who would do that uh, bond bill work, but that is still under, under discussion. So what are the deliverables uh, that are also very important part of the process? You know, Jim did a great job talking about community buy-in, getting enough public information out there, getting all the public comments back. So you are visioning what the community wants in the area. And part of that scope of work is a visioning process with the Board of Select and the Plan Board facilitated by the, by the Commission staff. We started this process a little bit back in January. Uh, they would like to advance that as part of a greater public forum with these two boards. Uh, one of the very important things they'd like in the scope of work is also stakeholder meetings. 
I think one of the reasons we did so well back in 2004 on East Main Street is we invited the entire East Main Street community in, the business owners, the property owners, the chamber. Uh, we made sure that the East Main Street redevelopment concept coincided at least with their thinking uh, that they do own the property. It's their uh, livelihood. We didn't want to make sure an intervention there that wasn't tenable. So that's also part of their scope of work. It's a really important part of their scope of work is the stakeholder uh, meeting and workshop. And then finally, obviously, they would give us a draft plan, uh, get this community's feedback, <coughs> your feedback, and then incorporate them into a, into a final draft. They envision a, a timeline that would give us some, a deliverable uh, this fall. I think that's ambitious. Uh, but we'll uh, advance those discussions as time goes on with the commission staff. And that's the scope of work that uh, the board's asked us to pursue back in January. No decision need to be uh, tonight. It's more of an introduction to it than anything else. Any questions you might have, any comments, bring back to the commission staff. And I know Pat and I want to advance this discussions with you perhaps at our next meeting. We'll discuss a time certain tonight. And that's my fast five minute synopsis. <laughs> Uh, and I'd be happy to answer your question. Pat. I have a question. Uh, is the funding for the Complete Streets program part of the transportation bond bill, or is that separate funding? You know? My understanding right now, Pat, is that we would be looking at a, a source of funds, a local source of funds to do some of the design and planning work. And then there are construction dollars that are part of the uh, bond bill. Jim. Would it be possible to revisit East Main Street and include the scope from Shore Street all, all the way in? Uh, we could always ask, Jim. Uh, but again, we're dealing with a, a limited amount of resources at their level in here. Also, the East, we can revisit perhaps some of the issues that came forward on East Main Street, but I, I wouldn't want it to duplicate the, the level of effort that we did 10 years ago, too. But we can ask the question. Integrate, I guess. Sure. Used. We want to make sure that we're not doing things in isolation. And we want to go to school on lessons learned on East Main Street and what we can do better on East Main Street, incorporate them down Davis Straits, and make it an iterative process back and forth. But I don't think they're going to include the, the entire mm -hmm. scope of work in East Main Street. No, but some of the things you talked about, like the pathway to the harbor and everything from downtown, we don't have that yet. And again, Jim, that's going to be up to their town to find right. some from the Davis Straits type area, which court area. We have some pretty good ideas where they might be flowing out of the East Main Street area. Uh, we, we visited that question uh, some time ago, but we can check with the commission staff to see to what extent they would like to incorporate some of the thinking here along East Main Street. How far back can we go? We might get back to Scranton Ave. Uh, but my sense is we're not going to get all the way back to Shore Street. And, and uh, at this point, I don't think I'd recommend it. Oh. Seems every month the planning board has another project to present to the Walgreens car, and we don't have this planning study completed. So I encourage you to get this completed as quickly as we can. It would be very helpful when we review it. Every time they come up with another project, we, we say, how does this fit into the planning study? We don't know. So it's extremely important. The meeting we had with the planning board, with the uh, board of Southern back, I believe it was in April, we talked about extending the scope of work, as Jim mentioned. And perhaps we can consider doing this in phases as funding becomes available, extend it from Jones Road to uh, Sandwich Road and from Scranton Avenue back to the uh, Bill of Green would make a lot of sense because there's a lot of need in both those areas rather than a small section in the middle. <clears throat> we'll bring that, we'll that comment back. I think what I would like to say here is that when we got the other report, we really use that as a springboard for our own comments at a joint meeting. Just because the Cape Cod Commission recommends something doesn't mean it's now in concrete. And the role of both of our boards is to vision the future of the town. And that doesn't mean that we have to just take what somebody says and go with it. We've got our own ideas and some really interesting comments came out of our joint meeting that could be pursued, and when we have the meeting with them for the visioning, we may recall what some of those were and present them to them. So that's some, a thought I'd like to plant. Um, as you 
speak about that. Um, I think we have to look at the Cape Cod Commission as a, more as a consultant mm -hmm. and not as any not any permitting or anything like that. But the other thing I think about was 20 some years ago when the Main Street renovation took place and how successful that was. Yeah. And of course Heather is still here and she was pretty much a mastermind on that project. Mm -hmm. Yes, she was. Mm -hmm. But the, the idea was that there was so much community input on that. And I think that and you mentioned that already, Brian, how important it is to get the business people, the people who live there, just people, people in the community who care about it, who use it, find really uh, important ways to engage them in this whole visioning process so that um, we, we end up with a much better product, I think, when we do that. There's another comment I would like to make, too, is that, as you recall, at our last joint meeting, Brian presented uh, pencil on a napkin plans from back in the 50s and how some of them happened and some of them didn't. Brian's very favorite comment that is just thrilled into my head is that planning is a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> and so what we come up with now doesn't mean we're going to see it in the next five years. It means it gives us a pathway to look at for the future. One more comment. I think, if you remember, 20 years ago, I think it was 20 years ago, we had the first sense of place meeting. And it was at Falmouth Academy. Eric Turkington kind of uh, spearheaded it and carried on the discussion. Everybody who wanted to be there was invited. I don't remember how many people came. And then, uh, but it was a very successful um, sort of uh, opportunity for everyone to just say what they think about the community and what needs to be done. Then 10 years later, we had a follow-up to the sense of place. So I reminded Eric that the 10 years is now up and it's time to do it again. And he is planning to put another one together in the fall. Okay. So I think the timing would be pretty good because it helped a lot with the visioning to have just people come and express their ideas about the community as a whole from every different aspect, not just from development. Yes, uh, part of the impetus for this has been uh, the renewed interest in redeveloping uh, that stretch of uh, Falmouth. And uh, there are those of us on the, on the board that do have a vision uh, for what we'd like to see there. And it's hard to convey that. And to have a study that helps convey that would be uh, most beneficial to anybody coming into town that has any redevelopment uh, opportunities or initiatives. Okay. Brian, will they prioritize the business section and then do the Greenway at the secondary phase, or will it all be at the they, same? They should all be on parallel tracks. They're all equally important. Mm -hmm. That is a significant portion to get design thoughts on. Mm -hmm. And what I really liked also is, they said, illustrated. It's one thing to have it all in words, but it's quite another to have it illustrated. So I think we have something really to look forward to with this report. And what do we need to do to get started? Uh, I think we need to uh, flesh this out a little bit with the commission staff and their leadership, uh, clarify uh, some sorts of funds and, and some roles and responsibilities of who might do what. We don't need two consultants out there at once. Uh, so hopefully we'll have this clarified for you by here. And then we probably ask for some sort of decision making. Anything? Any other further comments? Okay. So we'll move on now to coastal resiliency. As you recall, that was a very large topic at our joint meeting. Um, the planning board, well, first of all, our small committee has come up with what you have in front of you here, which is a goal and three policies. And the planning board has looked at it, and I think they're happy with it. And we're asking you now to look at it and see whether you see anything that's standing out that's lacking or should be changed in here, or whatever. Because you should remember, and this is in particular for the two new members, um, that the Board of Selectmen recommends the goal or goals and policies to the town meeting for their vote. That is what town meeting votes on. And then there are other things that bookend this. One is the 
uh, verbiage that goes with it to give the, our thoughts. So it's a nice little narrative. The other is the action items, and those change. Both of those bookends do not need the vote of town meeting because time goes on. The purpose of the goal and the policies is that they will live into the future. We're trying our best to look 50 to 100 years in the future, but I won't be around to know whether it's happened or not. So that, that's our perspective that we're looking at. So if you could take a look at that, just give a little bit of time to take a look at it and give us your feedback on it. I'd much appreciate it. Oh, and I probably should read it for our viewing audience, too. Okay. It's Coastal Resiliency, Community Goal, and Public Policies. The goal is Falmouth shall balance use, access, and enjoyment of coastal resources while allowing geologic and ecosystem shifts in response to weather-related impacts and sea level rise. Policy, policy one, Falmouth shall reduce the vulnerability of its infrastructure systems. Policy two, Falmouth shall create the tools to foster resiliency by preserving, restoring, and enhancing coastal ecosystems' ability to better absorb impacts. Policy three, Falmouth shall institutionalize community-wide adaptability. Sam. Uh, I guess I'd like you to give me a little better understanding of what you mean by the Falmouth shall institutionalize community-wide adaptability. What are you thinking there? That is so that Okay, let's, let's take the uh, senior group that, the words fail me right now, what they're called. But it started a number of years ago to see to senior needs volunteer-wise so that they could stay in their homes. Okay, that's one sort of community institution that would be there if we had a disaster to help. The other thing is to encourage neighborhood watches, if you will. Um, we talked about the one, I think it's in North Falmouth, where uh, particularly seniors who live alone, they watch for a shade to go up in the morning. If it doesn't, it's an uh-oh signal. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. We uh, want to see what might be necessary for businesses to come back from a disaster. And that's an institutionalization. We want that mapped out so that it's not sitting there sucking your thumb, what do we do next to come back from a disaster? So that's the kind of thing we're looking at when we say institutionalize. And you guys... More social in. than the infrastructure mm -hmm. is where the thought process would come from. You know, not, not streets and schools, and, mm -hmm. but the, the people. And the social organizations and working together and just getting all those organizations thinking about just being more resilient and dealing with... Uh, you know, the challenges of being a coastal community. Mm -hmm. We know that the town has stuff like this already in place. We're not looking to replace any of that. We're, as Jim said, it's more a, a social institutionalization as to how we can help our neighbors. Doug? I guess I'm confused about the goal. And when it says shall balance, what are we balancing? We're balancing use and access and enjoyment, those three things we're balancing? No, we're balancing those with allowing geologic and ecosystem shifts in response to. So what do we have to do to allow the continuation of whatever changes might happen geologically and ecosystem-wide? I guess then I, maybe it's grammatical, I'd say, we balance the use, access, and enjoyment with the acceptance of Geologic, we're not going to allow geologic ecosystems. You're right. We're so with the acceptance we're, of. That, we're balancing <laughs> this with this other thing. It's like we know geologic ecosystems are going to happen. We can't stop them completely. We can fight against them. But, okay. if I, Thank you. If I could pick up on that. Sure. It, it's not even allowing. It, it, it's, it's more no, protecting okay. against you. Your point is perfect, and I would go one step <coughs> further. Because below, we talk about fostering resilience by preserving, restoring. That's an action. That's preventing, not allowing. So the, the first, as, as you were saying, the first sentence seems almost in opposition to the other three. Okay. So I would bring it one step further, more towards the preservation 
or protecting. I'm not sure we can protect well, it. That's good. Well, yeah, we can. Yeah. Well, there, there are <laughs> places where they really try to fight it, like with gates mm -hmm. and you know dams and. Well, that's right, but it's certainly the opposite of allowing. Right. Well, I, well, the way I look at it is allowing is, is not trying to prevent it. It's mm -hmm. may, may allowing nature mm -hmm. to run its course, not saying, yeah, we're not going to do anything at all, <coughs> but allowing up to a certain point. So the understanding well, with the well, I mean, that's how I interpret it. If that's, well, I don't that, know if that's that what that you mean. we came up with that wording. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're not going to build jetties and storm whatever to prevent for? it. Hmm? Accounting for? Or how about it? Accommodation of future geologic and ecosystem shifts. Okay, so you're giving us all kinds of food for thought here. Yeah, accommodating instead system. of allowing. Yeah. How do you accommodate? Yeah. I mean, it's accepting. You have to define it. Yeah. yeah, Jim. We were really trying to be general and not specifically rule out anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, everyone here is saying we're not going to do this. We, we deliberately didn't say we're not going to do this, we're not mm -hmm. going to do that. We said we're going to balance the needs, there, our access to uh, the enjoyment of our coastal resources and our infrastructure, understanding we got these challenges. But we weren't specifically saying anything, we're absolutely going to do this. We were leaving that door open to, to be figured out of, over time. I kind of like the idea of accounting for, while accounting yeah. for. Sure. Because that's essentially, it's not allowing, yeah, but it's <laughs> sure. sort of, I like that. Yes, I, I think you. probably as I would read this and as I listen to you, uh, where else does this go? I think we can have this discussion, but how much of this is going to the public? Not right now the public is hearing it. it well, they, they are, but I mean after this. It is the local comprehensive plan. Once town meeting votes it. We started out, again, people have heard this, who've heard me say it before, but you three probably, maybe four of you haven't heard this before. We started out with a three-volume compendium many years ago for the local comprehensive plan. And various uh, boards and committees in town wrote their own little segment. It was done under the auspices of somebody who was a retired planner from Iowa, I believe. And it was mammoth. It was used as bookends. It was much too big for people to use. Um, it had been condensed to something. Again, it was submitted to the commission in 2005 and they didn't like it. So it, it is preliminary, if you will. It's a draft because they didn't accept it. But that's what we look at now and use. But again, it's been written in different voices. It's uneven. One chapter will be eight pages. Another one will be 30 pages. One has history, one doesn't. So what we are trying to do is keep each segment, each element, is about eight pages. And that includes the verbiage, it includes some nice little pictures so that people can look at that and enjoy reading it too. But we also want to have it written in one voice so that you know what to expect. It will start with the goal or goals. Wastewater and water has two goals because we combine those two elements. And then it will have policies, which we're striving to get three, probably no more than four, if we can encompass all the thoughts into those policies. Those will live into the future and be a guideline for the town into the future. I call them the feel-good stuff because they should live into the future if they are written appropriately. And then we have the action items. And this is where the different departments, it's where you all will come into what needs to be done here in the town. And when something is done, we cross it off, put something else in immediately. But it doesn't have to be a one-for-one one exchange. That's the living part of this document. It's the everyday guideline for what needs to be done. None of this has the force of law. It's not like our bylaws, our, our zoning, our health laws, our conservation laws. It's not like that. This is a map to work towards the future that we can agree upon. So I think I've tried to, to give you the sense of what this is. Yeah, Doug. And the other thing is on the policies. I would, I, mean, I would like the policies to refer back to coastal resiliency. In other words, right now you take policy one, policy three, separate from it, and you have no idea what it's talking about if you just read those words. And so I wouldn't mind them referring back to, we're talking about, that you read that coastal the policy all by itself. We're talking about 
vulnerability due to coastal problems. We're not talking, and some could say, what about the vulnerability of the infrastructure system due to bombings? Mm -hmm. and that's what we're talking about. We're, I would just say this is going back to a limited policy. It doesn't, it did not occur to us, and it probably never would occur to us, except for your bringing it up, that these would be separated. Could but be. they could be. Right. Things are taken out of context all the time. So thank you for that. Is there anything else that we can take back and reformulate? I would just say that as soon as the five of us took a look at it and it was fresh and those and the words and every one of you knew exactly as you were saying it. It started a conversation right mm -hmm. straight across and everyone had a different word that they thought would be more common for the people in town to read. Mm -hmm. So that was all I was saying. You've lived with it. I mean, you look at it and you just say it. I looked at it and said, I don't know which end of town I'm on. <laughs> okay. I just, uh, I would say this small amount of conversation over the choice of words has brought in the conversation of saying, well, what does that mean? So yeah. as long as you explain it, I understand that. But I didn't until we started to say, well, should it be changed? Maybe we need another word there. So. Yeah, you know, Becky, this is the job. kind of thing we do all the time, and yes. it's the kind of thing that when we bring it to the planning yes. board, it gets dissected. Yes, because that's very noted. That's, that, I noticed that. I mean, well, that part. what you have to understand is we have to be extremely clear, yeah. because 20 years from now, who's going to know what we meant? And some of that will come into the narrative, but not all of it. Each one of these words has to mean something very clearly. So I really thank you for all your comments. And if you think of something else, please get it to Marlene. I would really appreciate that. We meet every Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Um, any of you are welcome to one of those meetings. And we have a few people who come regularly who give us careful thoughts and input on this, too. They're not part of the, the subcommittee of the planning board but their input is very much appreciated, so I want you to keep that in mind, too. Okay? Yes, Sam. Yeah. Have you looked at any previous experience uh, in these kind of coastal resiliency uh, issues? I mean, there, we've certainly got lots of history that we can look back at, and I just thought that we might learn from those experiences in beginning to kind of build those action items um, and, yeah. to have a, and to have a, a vision of just what might happen and the, the challenges that this community might be facing. We've gone to school on Hurricane Sandy okay. because that is the closest sure. that we come to an experience that would happen here. As a matter of fact, it was supposed to bullseye Falmouth. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very good thing to look at and what could potentially happen were we the bullseye. Mm -hmm. This building in itself is extremely vulnerable to something like that. Um, there are a lot of places like that. So, yes, we've done that. But as Marlene has pointed out, mm, we're the first one out there with a coastal resiliency element. So we're on our own. We're leading the charge on this. So for better or for worse, we are creating this out of whole cloth. That's why the input we get from all of you is extremely important. Please know that this is whole cloth here that we're creating. Pat, uh, yes. This, this also spun off of land use, so this wasn't okay. a, a zone entity uh, initially. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. It seems to me we have our own history in Hurricane Bob, too. That was mm -hmm. a pretty significant impact that occurred that we could look at and the kind of, of uh, recovery mm -hmm. processes that we had to go through and maybe learn from some of those as well. But that was minor compared to what oh, could wow. happen. As Doug knows when he said it, a uh, joint meeting that surf drive is toast. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize to say it. Uh, I believe it too. I did not realize that surf drive is only three feet above the water level. I knew that the shoreline was disappearing in the 40 years we've been here. I mean, I remember when there was a really nice beach there that you could go out on. And George Hampson at one of our town meetings said that the water level in Woods Hole has risen a foot since the 40s. Now, that varies in different places, but that brings it right home. 
And I don't care whether you want to say it's global warming. I don't care whether you want to say it's the sinking of the land mass. It's a whole combination of things that we have to understand the reality that we are facing and prepare for it 50 years from now. Well, Tabakwood Beach is a very good example. Absolutely. There's very little beach left. There's mm -hmm. not going to be any sand to stick your head in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, other, the other thing I was going to say, Pat, that a couple, I think it was one or two years ago, I mean, maybe you and Brian and I and Marlene, I think we all Probably. attended the same conference. Yes. That okay. was put on by, the, by Webner, which they've been doing a lot, by the way, in uh, putting on workshops on coastal resources. They had one last week. I only got to one day of it. But um, the scientists, I mean, and some of the ones from Huey, like mm -hmm. Rob Thaler, mm -hmm. he, he's one of the ones who really studies coastal issues. And they, they are looking at the East Coast from Maine all the way down to Florida and <coughs> predicting what the East Coast is going to look like yep. in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, uh, what, what will be there, what won't be there. And maybe I mean, they're, they're right here. And uh, maybe sometime we should have a joint meeting and have one of them come and just present something similar to what we heard uh, that day a year or so ago, if you think mm -hmm. that would be helpful. To, to at least getting us all thinking in the same way, which now yeah. I don't think we are yes yet. Where I think it would be extremely helpful is when we're trying to um, determine the action items. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who have a good idea what we should be doing because we had discussed, well, we can armor the coast. You can elevate Surf Drive 10 feet up, but is this something that we can or should do? Is it something we can afford to do? When you talked about affording the senior center, that is all going to go down to cost. This is something that people don't think about because they want, but how much is it going to cost? Mm -hmm. So I think this is a critical discussion and I think um, Jeffress Williams, He's the one yes. that I read that said um, surf drive is only three feet above the water. And a teal, and um, there was the fellow from Harvard who said that I w was always um, naively thinking it's the Greenland ice shelf and north that was affecting our water rise. He said, oh, no. No, it's Antarctica. Antarctica. And I don't know whether you all read, but one of the ice shelves is irretrievably gone now. It cannot build up. It's gone. And that is what's going to affect our water level rise here. Don't ask me how. I don't understand all the physics or whatever else of it. But that <coughs> surprised me when he said that. So we're looking at change. And you can argue as much as you want as to the cause of it, but it's change. So is there... But yes, just as a yeah. suggestion, to try to make it real to, for us, and I, it seems like we ought to have a scenario that we can say, mm -hmm. here's a potential thing that could happen in the next 50 years, and here's the kind of impact we could expect. Now, what could we do to try to prepare for that? It, it, it would just be nice to have some tangible model of what might happen and then people start thinking about because I don't think unless you make it real to people in terms of what yeah. could be there I'm not sure you're going to spur those action items in any kind of realistic way uh, nor will you really get people to start placing some priority on the preparation right. for such an event. Well, this is where I think Pat's suggestion of getting some of these professionals in here at a joint meeting and that may be a focus of a Saturday meeting because we don't have time constraints mm -hmm. that way. Um, that I think if it could be televised that people could understand what's going on, they could put the scenario down and these are the options. Are they any good? Any of them. What do they cost in terms of our social life, in terms of our financial life? Uh, when we talk about reducing the vulnerability of its infrastructure systems, well, think about the sewer under the bike path. How many leaks has it popped already? Five, maybe, or more? And that bike path is vulnerable to sea level rise. What are we going to do? It's going to cost. That's the bottom line. It is going to cost. And then you have to decide what you're going to do, which determines how much it's going to cost. So it's these scenarios, I think, that if we had people here who deal with this and can paint the picture for us. You're right, Sam. Yes, Jim. P part of our, our planning is not to adopt one scenario and say this is going to happen. Right. 
what we're trying to say, these are the principles that work no matter what, okay, and, and focus on those. So if, in fact, we did have tremendous sea level rise, at least what we're planning here, at least we're, our goals are going in that direction. But we're not going to say, oh, we think the sea level is going to come up four feet and everyone's going to get out and we close down everything. We, that might be the case, but no, but no matter what, we need to plan for We know there's erosion going on. We know there's potential for sea level rise. And every time we deal with something, I mean, that's what we're trying to say here, is by balancing what we have now with the threats of the future and, and taking it, but not deciding I'm the one that argues I'm not ready to run away from the beaches and close down Surf Drive and move back 200 yards. I'm the one arguing the other side all the time. So we're trying to find a compromise in language that fits both sides. Sure. And that's what you're, you're, you see here a little bit of, of, of a balanced approach. About 10 years ago, I think, uh, some of the scientists um, from uh, Wittol did a sea level rise demonstration down on Surf Drive and they had, the, they had it staked going all the way up um, not Walker Street. Oh, Elm, yeah. I Elm went Road, up there. The Street? water would be right here, Pat. We wouldn't be in this building. I know. Well, I'm just saying that that was 10 years ago. But yeah. it would be very interesting to see where they would place those stakes today mm -hmm. and what the, the measurement would be in terms of time, you know, what, what they've been seeing and how that, how that whole thing might change. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like you said, anything could happen tomorrow. But you, you don't know what that something is, is. So you have to have some kind of a plan to deal with anything in that. Uh, yeah, it's just to give us a heads up. Yeah. So uh, as, as we come into situations in the future, we've got this in the back of our mind. Do we really want to put this there because of these potential risks that might be involved? So what I would be asking you all to do, because mm -hmm. the planning board has had time on this, is to take another look at this in regard to the discussion we've just had and see whether you have suggestions for any further changes. We got until fall town meeting. We intend to present this at fall town meeting, along with land use and hopefully uh, housing. That. And you might take a look at those new flood maps too that mm -hmm. yeah. illustrate yeah. the areas that are in danger. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, in North Falmouth, the uh, Silver Beach is very low lying land. This whole Main Street is very low. And so we're pretty vulnerable in a couple of very important areas. So thank you for thank that, you. for the discussion. And other topics raised by members, Nobska Light. Are you presenting? <laughs> Who's presenting this? I thought we could, just, we could give a little summary. Okay. Madam Chair, if you wanted to talk about the uh, meeting we attended. Yeah, well, there was a meeting today with um, a representative from the Coast Guard uh, who was explaining the process. Because um, uh, Whatever anyone or any group in the town might want to do, no one really, they, there's no ownership involved, it's a license. You get the license to, to, you, to use it, to operate it, according to federal guidelines. But it's a very long, 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 long process. And uh, I think what I heard, and I had to leave early, uh, was that the, the best way, there were different groups there too, that you could tell that there are different groups who are interested in, in preserving uh, mm -hmm. Nobska and possibly uh, um, ha having some kind of a license to do that. But, they, but I think what this individual said was that the best thing to do is for people to work collaboratively. That's what, they, that's what the government prefers is instead of just everybody trying to seek the same end or each trying to seek a license to work together and see if you can't do something collaboratively. So it's possible. There's, there's very strong interest among uh, organizations in the town to want to have a license to actually um, use the lighthouse for as a museum or for public use and uh, it's complicated but uh, it's doable and I think um, I don't know how they ended up but maybe Doug you were there longer what well, would you the, add? The two major takeaways I took I have from it one is it is a 60-day window starting June 5th to get a letter of interest and have a license There'll be one, one group that has a license, and certainly the push was all the other groups should work together to support that one individual or community, or whether it's a town, whether it's a state, whether it's a historic society. One group would have the license. And the second thing is, again, as Pat said, the sale of, Man of Anopska will not happen for 15, 20, if ever. 
that Babska is not up for sale. This is a license that could be a five-year license renewable many, many times. Babska is not being sold and will not be, if ever, for a long, long time. So um, would I be correct in saying that the government is looking for a caretaker for the building? A license, yeah. Yeah, but whoever gets that license would be expected to take care of the buildings at their cost. Mm -hmm. Well, they also, they also proposed a model similar to Highfield, where the town would own it, not own it, the town would be hold the license, but then someone else, like a nonprofit, um, would uh, lease it, say, from the town and operate it like, like Highfield does. The town owns Highfield, but the Highfield Inc. has a lease with the town, and they operate it and, and do all the work. So the, the woman from the Coast Guard suggested a model like that. She also mentioned how when it, there was a lighthouse, I think it was in Maine, they tried to sell. They actually wanted to sell it, and they offered it up for sale, and it waited and waited and waited, and nobody did. Nobody was the least bit interested in buying it. And then all of a sudden, somebody came along and bought it for a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And but then that was not any not a community use, and it became mm -hmm. a private. And then one of the ones that they got involved in, someone purchased it, and then just it disappeared. They just destroyed it, or whatever they did. With okay. it. I don't know. But anyway, they've learned some lessons. But remember, you're dealing really with the federal government here, not with yeah. the state. Well, considering that it starts June 5th, and we're already at the 23rd of June. Um, and this meeting today was kind of an introduction of the concept. Is the government likely to extend that deadline any further? They don't extend the deadline. She was very clear about that. The de in the but if nothing comes in oh. by the deadline, then the deadline's extended. Yeah. Yeah. It says if they do get one license application by the deadline, okay. then they're the ones who are not likely to get the license. Okay. If it, if it doesn't come in, they keep waiting. The other thing they did say is, this never happens. They never have a number of organizations looking to get a lighthouse. It's usually, they're lucky to find one. Mm -hmm. And so they want this process of putting out a notice of intent this time, one of the very few times, because three or four organizations said, hey, we're really interested in preserving it. I don't think competitively as much as we have a bunch of people in this town who say, we're going to do what yeah. we can to save it. And she's saying, then work together. Yeah. Just yeah. work together and come up with a plan that have everyone's groups involved in it and submit the license. And either don't agree, don't to send it in early and take your time, or send it in on time. And then it okay. And see. just to add that, that, for example, the Woods Whole Village Association got very much in front of this right on. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what stimulated and organized. Uh, Begin, you know, begin to organize the interest, and, and the groups have been working collaboratively, so probably the deadline will, you know, will be difficult, but mm -hmm. certainly not impossible. It's just a letter of intent. Oh, it's just a letter of intent. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. It's not a big proposal. No, no. no. Okay. 120 days after that. Okay. Well, we've got a nice iconic lighthouse here that we certainly do not want to lose for the Falmouth Town. So. Make a great bed and breakfast. <laughs> well, that's, that's an that issue. Yeah. 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 Occupancy. Mm -hmm. They don't want people to live there. That, that requires all kinds of different rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. If someone lives, just sleeps in there one night, oh my yeah, it's, a, it's a totally different package. Wow. Mm -hmm. they, just, they, they prefer it to be just a museum where people come and go. Okay, folks, we've got a minute and a half, and we have to have our next, next meeting scheduled. Day. Um, what's it going to be? Do we have a Did we get any consensus? July 29th. Oh, it July is. Yeah, July 29th. The selectmen can do That's that. Tuesday. July yeah, 29th. So the selectmen meet the, the night before. 28. You guys ought to do what we do. We don't have a meeting tomorrow night. Because <laughs> we're meeting tonight. Yes, August 18th. We're looking at as a. Finance, yeah. So it's going to be the 29th, then it sounds like. The 29th. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'd hope to be able to schedule that date in July to keep yes. this momentum going. Because with what we're we talking have town about. meeting March exactly. and all that coming up. Exactly. Okay. So the 29th. Well. Okay. Yes, Paul. 
make a motion to adjourn this joint meeting so the board selects and get on with their business. Is there a second to that motion? Second. second. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.